So if you've been with us in the last two weeks, I've been talking about the, the necessity of slowing down and living within limits, honoring the Sabbath, and living in a rhythm that's sane for your life. And so if you've been here, you're going to be grateful that I'm not going to do it for a third straight week. I think you've probably gotten the point um, about the significance of, of really living a life that's sustainable and uh, living at a pace where rest is woven into the fabric of your weekly activity. This morning I'm going to be talking about how to not be so easily offended. I thought there might be one or two of you who could use this. And the title of my message is Get Over It. And so, I want to begin by talking with you about a few experiences I had. I was standing in an era this week. It's only been about 150 degrees for the last couple of weeks. And it's hot, and I don't know if you do, but when it tends to be hot for extended periods of time, I get a little cranky, and I, um, I'm less, find myself being less patient than perhaps normally I might be, and I'm standing in line, and as the line has made its way to the front, all I can envision is this nice big iced tea uh, flowing down my gullet, and I am ready to put out my 234 to get my large iced tea of Panera, and I'm standing there, and it's just about my time, and a lady walks right in front of me, from the side, as if I didn't exist. <laughs> Now there's a few thoughts that immediately come to mind. <laughs> what were they, Vince? <laughs> and I must say that none of them were pleasant. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I'm looking behind me and maybe looking for a camera to see if maybe I'm <laughs> It was as if I didn't exist. And more than just the rudeness of the act, what began to happen inside of me was it tapped into some place that said, I'm insignificant. That I could just be so easily disregarded as to somebody come, not acknowledge my presence, not care at all. And so it hit me in some place and I was offended. I was offended for a whole multitude of reasons, none of which that lady intended in the first place. Truth of the matter is, she probably didn't, she probably wasn't even paying attention, but she probably wasn't even aware that, of what she was doing, if I want to give her the benefit of the doubt. It's very possible. There are a million places along our day, week, lives where we could become offended. I've been coaching Little League this week. Some of you have been sort of following our journey, and last night we, we lost in the championship. We got the right to the championship and we lost. It was a double elimination tournament. Um, we lost the very first game, and then we won five in a row. And we got back to play the team that we played that had beaten us. We beat them on Friday, so it was now best two out of three. And so we lost last night. But one of the things that I have found is when you are coaching, and you guys know I coach, but when you get to a place where you're coaching all-stars, everybody's son is an all-star. <laughs> So everybody has a lot of information to give you and advice and direction. Of course, I need all of that, right? So there's so many places along the way when on day one we lost our first game that people needed to make me aware of all the things that needed to be done to get us back in the right place. And to be honest, even when we were winning five in a row, um, there's still people who were disappointed about the amount of time their son got to play. And so, you know, it's really kind of a, for the most part, most people are blessing and, and, they, and they are supportive and encouraging. But sometimes in life, if there's one or two or three people who say something or do something or don't say something they need or don't do something, it can be irritating and offending. As I looked back and reflected over the course of even just this past week, I, I thought about all of the places where it would have been so um, rife with opportunity to be easily offended. And in some places I was, and in some places I, I wasn't. And so what I want us to do as we're getting started this morning is I want us to think about 
I want us to think about our own lives. Let's just even take this last week, for example. And I want you to think about the last time that you can remember that you were offended. I want to give you just a couple of seconds to think about that. When was the last time that you can remember being offended? And as you think about that, I want you to think about why it was that you were offended. You know, sometimes you can take something super small and make it really big, right? You can personalize something so much so that it takes what is just something insignificant and you create a great deal out of it. When was the last time that you were offended? And why was it that you were so offended? And then, what was it that you did with your offense? Because that really is going to be the significant <coughs> part of what we're talking about this morning. See, the truth of the matter is, um, offenses come and they go. Many people, believe it or not, can be offensive, right? Turn to your neighbor and say to them, it might be a surprise to you, but sometimes I can be offensive. <laughs> Just to kind of get language. And 
You know, this week I actually like the King James Version. It's rare that I like the King James Version because a lot of it is just not a language that I speak or understand well. But this week I, I, I like that. So I'm going to be reading from the King James Version, Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to be reading uh, verses 10 through 13. Now just to give you an idea of what's happening here, this is the last week of Jesus' life. And he's talking with his students, his disciples, about a variety of different topics. He's preparing them for his departure. Um, and as a part of his discussion with them, he is telling them about some of the signs that they're going to see that are going to lead them towards the end of the age. And uh, as he does so, he warns them about this. He says there's going to be a majority of you, meaning believers, meaning followers of Christ, who are going to be offended to such a degree that you're actually going to fall away from your faith. Now, did you, did you know that you could be offended to such a degree that you could actually fall away from your faith? That's powerful, don't you think? That I can allow offense to find such a home in me that it actually shipwrecks my entire faith. And Jesus is warning his disciples. He's saying, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be people doing stuff to you guys, saying things about you guys. And it is going to be wildly offensive. And if you're not careful, what's going to happen is you're going to lose your faith. And so let me just warn you. Let me just tell you, this is going to happen. Prepare for it. And I find that when I prepare for things, I'm much better able to deal with them than when something takes me by surprise. Are you? I'm much better able to deal with stuff if I have a little time for preparation. So he's trying to give them some preparation time. And so he says the following, beginning in verse 10, Matthew chapter 24. And then shall many be offended, and, and the word there for many is most, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, most, shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now I don't know whether you noticed in those three or four verses that I just read to you that there is this progression. And the progression begins with someone being offended, with an offense. Now, if you look at verse 10, there are two more things that happen in this progression. Do you know what the next thing that the verse says happens? Betrayal. Okay, we're going to walk through this progression in just a minute. <coughs> I'll put this down. And then, when offense leads to betrayal, betrayal eventually leads to what? Hatred. Hatred. Great. I mean, not really, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, so as I was thinking through, like, just possible responses to offense this week, I thought about three. There could probably be a hundred, but I was just thinking that they're basically primary responses that we have when we are offended. The first is, when I'm offended, I will sit and stew on the offense. I won't say anything to anybody, but I'm going to be thinking certain things. I might even get to the place where I'm plotting revenge. Right? It might get to that place, right? Am I the only one? No. So sometimes we get to that place where we're offended, and rather than do something, we start to think about it. And the more we stew on it and let it marinate, the worse it gets. And it becomes like a virus inside of us. And by the way, let me say to you, for those of us who sit and stew on stuff, we think that we can contain it just in this one relationship. But I'm telling you, you cannot. Once you allow offense to find a home in you, it not only moves into the living room, it finds a bedroom, it finds a den, it goes into the kitchen looking in your cabinets, it goes down into the basement, it finds a place inside of you and it can be contained solely in the context of one relationship. It spills over. So one of the responses that we have to offense is that we sit and stew and marinate and even plot revenge. The second is we, we are offended and then we complain to other people about it. This is one of our favorite things to do, right? 
So just for the purpose of informing them about what happened to us, <laughs> we start to talk to other people, and then we begin to malign the character of the person who offended us, right? And then we get teams of people on our side who see things the way that we do, and what a nasty, rotten, dirty person that other person really is. I know none of you have ever done this before, <laughs> but sometimes this happens. Sometimes we create this animosity and we get other people to join us in it. By the way, these first two responses lead to breakdown and <coughs> betrayal. Now there is a third option. It's a viable option. It's not often tried or not as often tried as maybe would be valuable to us. But there actually is an option that says, you know what? I can go directly to that person and communicate clearly how I felt when they did or didn't do, said or didn't say, what I felt like should be done or said. I actually have the capacity to go and have a reasonable discussion with the person and seek restoration. Because at the end of the day, there was a relationship that I once had that I valued. And if I really valued it, I might, I might consider humbling myself and going to that person not in a condemning way. Because sometimes what happens when people hurt us is we want to hurt them back. We want them to have a, 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 something of the same feeling that we had when they hurt us. We want to pound the flesh. But it never really leads to restoration. I have found that when I have conversations with people who hurt me, if I'm a little vulnerable with them, that it is much more likely to lead to restoration than if I'm angry with them. Because when I'm angry with them, it only generates the kind of energy that ups the level of the anxiety that exists in the relationship. And so what happens is, for you and I, when we are offended, there is a possibility for you and I to pursue honestly going to a person, humbly presenting ourselves, vulnerably letting them know what happened, and asking them for the possibility of finding restoration somewhere, because there's fracture. You know that almost in every relationship that exists for any period of time, if it exists long enough, there's going to be fracture. How many people in this room have ever had a relationship where there wasn't any fracture along the way? Like never. Just never. Okay. If, if, if you do, great. God bless you. Continue on and maybe hold a class in the next few weeks to teach us how to do that. But I think if you know someone long enough, you're going to inevitably have fracturing in your relationship. What you do with the fracturing is going to be what is significant. Because Jesus says, many of us, most of us, are going to be offended. Right? Most of us are going to be offended. The issue, the key issue is, what happens when we are? Offense leads to betrayal. Now, this whole issue with betrayal is an interesting one that I want to unpack uh, for just a moment with you. I believe betrayal comes when we begin to seek our own benefit at the expense of the one we are in relationship with. Betrayal comes when we seek our own benefit at the expense of the one we're in relationship with. In Proverbs chapter 18, it says, Someone offended is harder to be one than a strong city. Contentious, contentions between people are like the bars of a castle. Now, in that day, cities were fortified with walls, right? To protect the city, there were walls built around, and then there were sentry guards who would be on top of the wall so that if people were trying to come in and take the city, they would be able to defend themselves. So the city in that day would build walls around it for protection. Right? In the New Testament, the word that they would use for walls built around cities, does anybody know what that word is? It starts with an S. We build it stronghold. Okay. 
And just using the metaphor of self-protection, in our lives, we also have the capacity to build the same. Okay? The nature of God <coughs> is to give. God is the most generous being in the entire universe, planet, world, whatever. Okay? Now, when we come to a place where we are offended, what begins to happen is we develop thought patterns that cause us to withhold and to protect ourselves. We build strongholds around, and rather than be generous and giving and open and compassionate and loving and caring and kind, we become shut up. We become self-protected. We become unlike God. And this comes at the expense of relationship. Offense leads to betrayal, and betrayal ultimately leads to hatred. Now the word used for hatred here is not this I'm so angry with you, this venomous, this, this lot of emotion to it. The word used for hatred is loveless, a vacuum without love. And did you know that as you began to build walls around your heart, the essence of who you are, you began to isolate yourself? Because that's what happens when you build walls, you isolate yourself. You move from a place of openness, of receptivity, of generosity, of giving. You move yourself into a place of closedness and into a place of self-protection. And as you do so, you not only isolate yourself against the one who offended you, but you isolate yourself against God. Because once you start to isolate, you can't contain the one individual in your isolation. There's something that happens when you begin to build those walls of self-protection. And it changes something inside of you. You don't initially see it at first. But if you live long enough and you're honest with yourself, when you do some examination, what you will begin to see is once you have allowed offense to be harbored in your life, it has changed you in some way but not for the good. It is never good to harbor offense, ever. There's never any good reason to harbor offense. Many, most, will be offended. What you do with the offense will determine the health of your soul and the larger community, faith community, and even world that you exist in. Now, the greatest temptation that we face when we entertain offense is to be led out of love. It's the greatest temptation we face when we entertain offense. It's to be led out of love. That is God's system for living for you and I, by the way. If you didn't, if you didn't know that, primary to the Christian faith is this concept called agape, unconditional love. And God gives it to us in order that we might receive it, be changed by it, and then give it to others. It's God's design for His world. Now when we entertain offense, one of the greatest temptations is that we be led to live outside of love. And that, that is a greater danger than you can possibly imagine. Now I want you to just think for a second about, about what that means to Because every interaction, every exchange, every opportunity that you have to connect or not with another person, when you are living outside of love, you are moving away from God's design and plan for your life. Now, you can make excuses for why you are, but at the end of the day, is it leading you away from God or towards God? The truth of the matter is, when you live outside of love, it's leading you away from God, always. And so that's why when we are offended, we do not harbor offense, because we don't want to get into a place where we are living according to the system of our enemy. We do have an enemy. And the enemy seeks, roams the earth, looking for places, opportunities, to turn us away from God's best. 
And when we relent in the face of being offended, we move in the direction of our the enemy's advance in our lives. It's true. Now, when we walk in love, there are a number of great things that happen in our lives, okay? The first is, when we walk in love, that is where power is. <coughs> now, I, I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but the most powerful force in the universe is love. It is. Some of you, as you think back and reflect in your life, if you've ever been given love that had no conditions attached to it, and some of you might not have ever received this kind of love, but if ever you've been in a place where you were loved and received that love solely because you are, you will know how that felt. It is the most powerful force in the universe. It's largely just untried. But as it has its way in us and we walk in it, it is a powerful force. And so we want to walk in love because that's where our power is. That's where God can do God's greatest work in our lives. That's where His anointing flows. That's where His blessing resides. That is the place where all good things come from. So when we walk in that, we're not easily offended. We don't take everything personal, even if it was made that way. Because when we take things personally, and we harbor them, and we dwell on them, and we let it marinate, and we talk to others about it, it does nothing to lead us into love. Nothing. It leads us away from it. It's actually doing damage to your soul. What if, what if one of my primary uh, priorities was to guard and protect my heart from all of the possibility of damage that could come my way? It's where the wellspring of life is, your heart. If I don't guard and protect my heart from the possibility of offense doing damage, what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to constantly be annoyed by people who walk in front of me who don't yield to me in traffic, who don't invite me to the party I wanted to go to, who, who forget me when it's time for me to feel like I need to be a part of something, who slander me and tell me that I should be doing this when I know I should be doing that. At every turn, there's the possibility for offense. Many will be offended. And it will actually cause some of us Jesus said, most of us, to shipwreck our faith. Why would we allow ourselves to move into that place? Our love is our power, and when we're seduced out of it, you know what happens? We're powerless. We're powerless. We are vulnerable to the enemy's advance in our lives. Harboring offense blocks blessing. Harboring offense blocks power. Harboring offense blocks God's movement and advance and development and maturing in your life. That's what it does. It shrinks your soul. That's why it's so dangerous. Jesus said offense would lead many to fall from the faith. He linked apostasy not to wrong reaction. Uh, he linked apostasy to wrong reaction, not wrong doctrine. In Matthew chapter 24. He says it's your response to the offense that is significant. It starts with offense, then it moves to betrayal, then it moves to hatred, a place where there is no love. You see how the direction of that's dangerous? I just want to stop you and ask you for a second. Is there a place inside of you that has no love for an individual in your life right now? Maybe it's a person that's in your family. Maybe it's a person in your workplace. Maybe it's somebody who's no longer in your life anymore. You know what? Not every difference gets resolved. Not every difference gets resolved. But what needs to be resolved is in your own heart that there's not going to be a place for you to entertain offense, to harbor offense, to be negative and critical and judgmental. Because once you open yourself to that, you open yourself to moving away from God's blessing. His power, His love, 
It's fellowship. There's nothing there good for you. Jesus linked apostasy to wrong reaction, not wrong doctrine in Matthew chapter 24. The essence of the Christian faith is love. You cannot be so easily offended and walk in love. You just can't. It's impossible. So you say, well, I'm all right, I hear you. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, maybe I even partly agree. But I don't know what to do about it. I'm just easily offended. I can't help myself. I've been cultivating this for years. My skin is thin. I can't help it. And I would say to you, there are some things that we can do to get us back into a place of right living with God. Let me just ask you a question. Do you think that God wants you to be easily offended? Does it seem like a good thing to anybody? It doesn't seem like a good thing to me, does it? Some of us are. I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> I'm not naming names. But some of us are easily offended. And I say that only because in the journey that I have had in my own life with you, there are places in my life where I can recognize along the way that I've been very thin-skinned too. Whether it be because I was insecure about certain things that I needed you to fill up in me, or whether it was stuff that I was proud about, or there's lots of places along the way where you can get very thin-skinned. I don't think it serves you well. It doesn't serve you well, it doesn't serve this church, and it doesn't serve the kingdom of God. And if you, if you can be honest enough with yourself, there are some things that you can do that can get you back on the right track. And I just want to share a few of those with you before we close. <coughs> you know, in our lives, we can, we're constantly cultivating, kind of like we would with the garden, right? There's this process when you're going to grow fruit or flowers or whatever it is that you're trying to grow, where you need to break up hard ground, and then you need to turn over the soil, you need to plant whatever the seed is that you're trying to grow, you water it, you let the sunlight bathe it. There's this process of cultivation that has to exist, and the same thing exists in our own lives. We're cultivating an environment where things will grow or die. And so when God talks about in His Word about the fruit of the Spirit being born in our lives, things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and goodness and self-control, these are the fruits that God wants to bring forth in our lives, but there's an environment that is required for those things to be born. Did you know that, that if, if I'm a hard person, if I'm an unforgiving person, if I'm a cynical person, if I'm a negative person, that 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 ground needs to be broken up. Because like, if I want to see it on the blacktop, nothing good is going to grow. It, just because you come to worship on Sundays, and you live like you live from Monday through Saturday, it doesn't mean that just one hour in a place like this is going to do it. You actually have to care enough about your own life to begin to nurture and cultivate a place where the seed of God's goodness can grow in you and flourish in you. And so that requires looking at and listening to your life so that you can see what needs to stay and what needs to go. Now in Psalm 119, 165, it says, Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing shall offend them or make them stumble. Nothing shall offend them. So there's this place in our life where the Word of God needs to be sown into our lives. <coughs> there's this place where the Scripture has a central place for you and I to entertain. I know some of you, at the thought of reading the Bible, it makes your head hurt. Right? You know, when you sit down to read, you don't understand it. You can't <coughs> comprehend it. Your mind's in a variety of different places. If, if that's the case, let's just talk over the next weeks. Let's figure out a way for you to find a place for the Word of God to reside in some way in your heart. You need to be receiving that. Because the Scripture says, Great peace have they 
who love your law, nothing shall offend them. There needs to be a place where quiet is entertained in your life. We don't need to live at such a pace where there's constant noise and distraction. Sometimes we just need to turn aside and to be still. There's a place for self-examination. We talked about that in the prelude. There's a place for cultivating our interior life so that good things can grow. And there are practices and disciplines that can help us. We've talked about that many, many times. I think in responding to offense, one of the first things we need to do is be aware of the fact that we have to be cultivating an environment where offense can't find a home. And if offense is finding, home, uh, finding a home, we need to break that ground up. Because nothing good is going to grow there. Next, you know, whatever happens to the benefit of the doubt? I mean, really. I don't see it being given much anymore. We jump to conclusions, we make judgments so quickly. I mean, it's very possible that the lady who butted in front of me that I was having negative thoughts about, it's very possible that there was an entirely different thing going on in her personal world. Right? I didn't know. Sometimes the people who cut you off, maybe they're in route to the emergency room. I don't know, maybe. Chances are good, it's good that they're going somewhere super important and that they're a jerk. Right? Whatever happened to the benefit of the doubt? Whatever happened to saying, you know, I, I don't know all the facts. I don't need to jump to a conclusion and make a judgment. I think sometimes we just be, need to be reminded that, like, you know what? I don't need to fill in the blank. I just need to relax a little bit. Maybe I need to go about five miles per hour slower in my car. Maybe when we were hitting this place of yield, if I'd have been going slower, there wouldn't have been an issue. Why did I have to speed up to get ahead of that person so they didn't get ahead of me, right? <laughs> You're laughing because... <laughs> so, so we want to cultivate the space in us that offense can't be harbored. We, we want to begin to give people the benefit of the doubt. Let's say we, we know the person's a scoundrel. Give them the benefit of the doubt anyway. It's not going to hurt you. Do you need to make a judgment? Is it your place to make a judgment anyway? No. We don't need to put a fortress around our heart. It isolates us from God and from everyone else. Next thing is, what, what about when someone offends us? I know this is a novel idea. What about when someone offends us, if, if rather in the right spirit, and for some of us it might take a day or two, but what if we actually just went to them and just said, you know what, I, can I have five minutes of your time? The last couple of days I've just been out of, out of sorts, and here's why. And I'm not blaming you, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I just want you to know this is what it did to me. And I, I just... Um, I'm sure you're probably unaware and you haven't given it a second thought, but it's just been eating me up inside. And it's actually what's happened is, is it's made me not want to relate to you anymore. It's made me not like you, actually. And um, I don't want that to be there. So I hope you will forgive me for the thoughts I've had against you. The way in which I've talked behind your back. I mean, this takes real courage, right? We, It's a... It's really a risk of faith, but what happens when you do this kind of thing, if you do it once, the chances are great you'll do it again and again, because what happens is your relationships get restored. You know, nine times out of ten, the person will say, you know what, I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that I had done that, that I had said that. Or even if they say, you know what, this is why I did it. I thought you did that. You said this. You said that. You didn't invite me here made me feel like this. And I was just kind of getting back at you. And you could say, well, let's just, let's just forgive each other. Let's start it over and, and try to learn from it. I mean, this is a mature way, right? I don't want you to always and forever be infants and babes. I, I want you, I want us to grow up. And being in relationship with people where we live in love requires that we grow up. That we, that we actually be mature. Every time you resist or refuse that need to reconcile, 
You're blocking blessing from your life. You just need to know that. There are repercussions for acting in an infantile way. You block blessing. It's true. And then, the last two things are, whatever happens to forgiveness? Really? Peter said, you know what, how about we just, he thought he was being magnanimous in his spirit when he was saying, you know, how often do we need to forgive people when they wrong us, when they hurt us? Seven times, and he thought he was being super magnanimous. Because on that eighth time, I'm going to let him have it, but I think I can go up to about seven. That's double what the law required. I'm a really good guy. And Jesus said, well... How about take your seven and times it times seventy? How about seventy times seven? They didn't have calculators in that day, so I don't think Peter could count that high. So Peter was just like, so all the time then? Yeah, yeah, all the time then. Yeah, all the time. You know, unforgiveness only hurts you. It really doesn't even hurt the other person. It really, truly doesn't. And so when you get to this place in your life where when you're thinking about yourself, you're examining your heart, and you, and you recognize that there's this place in you that hasn't yet forgiven somebody, could be your dad, could be your mom, could be a sibling, could be a former friend. You know, I had to come to a place in my life with some family members for a long time that I held, that I withheld forgiveness. I did it for my dad. My dad was here last week. And I went many years and I harbored unforgiveness in my heart towards him because there were places in my life that I just thought he should have done differently than he did. He was largely absent. He was a workaholic for, for the better part of his life. He did the best he knew how to provide for our family. And he's a good guy. But there are a lot of things that he missed in my life. And I was resentful about it. And there came to a certain place when I grew up that I really just didn't want to have too much to do with it. So we live about 350 miles apart. And it's only really been in the last couple of years that we've started to communicate and, and see restoration in our relationship. You know, I was a pastor in this church and I had unforgiveness in my heart towards my dad. So I would imagine that there's a possibility that there might be a few of you in this place who are really trying to do it right. You're really trying to seek God as best you know how. But there's a blessing blocker in your life, and that is that you're just unforgiving in your heart towards somebody. And I just want to encourage you to say, listen, it is not an easy journey when someone has disappointed you greatly, when someone has wounded you, offended you, over years to let that go, to release them, to forgive them. But the only thing I can say to you is that if you do, it will lead you to life. The kind of life that you want. And if you don't, it's going to block blessing from your life. It's going to block the possibility of you knowing the fullness of joy. Because you can't harbor offense and have joy. You just can't. 70 times 7. And then finally, I said it to you earlier, I think there is this place where you and I need to look at and listen to our lives pretty frequently on a daily basis if we can, because stuff just sneaks in. We can be so disconnected from our lives because we're so busy trying to do the right things. But some places along the way, what happens is our best intentions lead us astray. And before we know it, we're becoming somebody we didn't want to be. And we're moving in a direction we didn't really want to go in. And I think if we can honestly look at our lives and listen to them each day, there might be a place where we can learn some things. Where God can speak to us about what's right and what's not. What should be in us and what shouldn't be in us. Because I have found that it's a lot easier if you do this more frequently than if you don't. There have been places in my life that I've gone so far down a given road 
And when finally I was awakened to the fact that I was on this dead end road, I didn't realize I'd been traveling it for months. All that causes us to move in a wrong direction is a certain pivot. One choice, one decision, one action, followed by another action, another action. And then before you know it, you're so far down the road you didn't even realize it. And then you have this epiphany, this revelation. You're like, what have I been doing? How is it that I got here? How is it possible that I could be in this place? <coughs> Anybody ever had that happen? You're just, you were so unaware that you were traveling down that road. So I think when I'm thinking about how to respond to offenses and trying to help you, I, I need you to understand that there's a cultivation in your spirit that needs to happen that only you can do. The creation of space <coughs> and worldly things. The benefit of the doubt that needs to be extended. <coughs> the clearly communicating with others who have offended us. The forgiving people when they've wronged us. And then ultimately the self-examination. These are things that probably you should be writing down. These are things that you should be thinking about if, if you've ever wrestled with harboring offense. Jesus says, many, most, will be offended. And for many, most, it will lead to betrayal. And for many, most, it will take you to hatred. So much so that your love will eventually, what did he say, wax cold. Is that where you want to be? For your heart and the love that God gave you to receive and to give, it actually waxes cold. And then he says, your faith will be meaningless. You will actually abandon your faith. Because if you don't have love, you don't have faith. See how central love is to faith? It is primary. Some things we just need to get over. Just need to get over. Mm -hmm. Because if we continue down the road we're on, it's going to greatly impact our faith. And I'm just saying to you, from the things that I'm learning, not have learned, and learning, and the things that I want to share with you, we're going to be a much better place and a much better people if we can live in love <coughs> and not fix. Amen? Amen. These are the things we now know. <coughs> now, we take them into action and do. And when we do them, life changes. It gets better, not only for you, but for everybody that knows you, when you change, your world changes, and it becomes a better place. So let's be about the creation and the recreation of a better world, that God's kingdom would come and His will be done on the earth in this place as it is. offense and to make home for love. Help us to be the kind of people you created us to be when you said yes to us and our creation. 
I pray that all over this room that there would be the beginning of a willing, willingness to release offense <coughs> and to move into a place where we don't take everything so personal. That we trust your sovereignty and your goodness in our life to be worked out and your justice to prevail. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.